The other NAFTA case I was involved in was a constitutional challenge to the mechanism as offending the division of powers between our executive and judicial branches, which would have traction in the United States as well. Let me first kind of describe what this mechanism is in my terms, my non-legalese terms. It's, um, it's, it, it is the most pernicious feature of the entire free trade regime and edifice. It is an entirely radical, indeed revolutionary, I'm not using any hyperbole here, uh, development of international law because it gives an untold number of transnational corporations the right to enforce international treaties to which they are not party and under which they owe no obligation whatsoever. That's revolutionary, it's radical, it's quite profound in its implications as you're getting to learn if you're not already familiar with the, with the mechanism. It allows transnational corporations to circumvent the constraints that limit the extent to which and the alacrity with which one state will beat up another because it's unhappy with the policies or laws that state lawfully and constitutionally may put into place. We're aware that states get into trade disputes with each other, but there are many constraints on the willingness of one nation state to take another to task for its otherwise lawful policies and laws. There are diplomatic constraints, there are, uh, there, are, there are strategic constraints, there are financial and fiscal constraints, there's the risk of retaliation. None of those constraints apply to investor state litigation. There's no reciprocity, there's no risk, there's no concern for international diplomacy or the comedy of nations. Uh, that's another way in which this agenda is truly radical. The third is, in that it transcends the limitations that restrain the ability of one state to beat up another by engaging the very apparatus of that other state to punish it. Let me explain what I mean. Though. If, I, if I file a trade complaint against you, and I'm, my position is exonerated, my remedy is to impose a border measure against your goods coming into my country. In other words, my remedy is my own domestic constitutional remedy against something that some international body has found to be in breach of a treaty obligation you owe me. In the case of investor state disputes, you take your award, you can go to the court of the offending state, Canada in the S.D. Myers case, go to its superior courts, register your award, and invoke the enforcement apparatus of that state to punish the government for doing something that is otherwise entirely lawful and constitutional. That's radical in my lexicon. So those are three of the ways in which this regime is completely beyond the pale, utterly upside down in terms of inverting corporate and human rights, and we have to get rid of it. So the talk that I want to give you today, that was just the introductory talk, <laughs> What's important to remember is our power in this uh, struggle and the fact that we've often succeeded. And I think that's true with, its, with respect to this mechanism because when it surfaces, uh, and of course their favorite strategy is the covert clandestine strategy that keeps this subterranean so nobody knows what's going on until it's already happened. But when it surfaces, it's been beaten back uh, one of the most significant victories that civil society has had in, in, in fighting this neoliberal agenda as it's expressed through these international trade and investment treaties is the MAI. You know, negotiated in secret with the imprimatur of the OECD, it failed. And it failed almost entirely because of resistance by civil society. It's a great victory for us. The investment uh, in state mechanism, the corporations have wanted to embed in the WTO. They tried in, in 95, and it, it, their entreaties were rejected. They tried again in the Doha, Doha round, they were rejected. Those again are important victories. When the issue comes forward and it, it breaks the surface, and we actually get a chance to see it and think about its implications, civil society and the international community has said no thanks. Um, now, having had the front door closed, uh, the corporations didn't simply say, okay, well, all right, we've lost. 
uh, we'll think of something else. Um, in a way they did, they used the back door, and that's to have negotiated bilateral investment treaties. You know, there were probably, I don't know, probably about 250 of them in 1990. They're now well over 2,500. The reason there are so many is if you're Argentina, you will have negotiated investment treaties with a dozen or so OECD countries and another one with some South America. So you have a whole number of them. Each country has negotiated a whole series of these. And embedded into those agreements is the same mechanism. Uh, and so what they haven't been able to kind of accomplish through the front door, they've managed to maneuver and establish through the side and the back door. Now, we've also had success in containing that agenda as well, because it happened in a covert, clandestine way. People aren't aware of the fact that this framework of international uh, law has been created in bits and pieces. But it's clear that when civil society organizes around these issues, these disputes can be defeated. Uh, in Canada, I think the fact that the UPS case failed, in the US that the Methanex case failed, is simply uh, a reflection of and a testament to the fact that uh, civil society has raised the profile uh, of this issue as much as it has, and has made clear the stakes to these corrupt private adjudicators and adjudicative mechanisms that there may be consequences in terms of perhaps killing the goose that's laying the golden egg if they decide a case against the United States or go too far in deciding a case against Canada. So that too, I think, is a reflection of our mobilization and efforts to kind of raise the profile of these issues uh, and to defeat them. Um, so um, that's uh, a story of some success. Let me describe where I think we go from here, and that is that what, what the investor state suit mechanism is accomplished, I think the, the intentions were to establish uh, a binding international instrument that would codify the neoliberal agenda of privatization, deregulation, and free trade, every single feature of which is corrosive of environmental sustainability. And, uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't an error. Uh, and if it, 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 if, if, even if one might conceive of, of chapter 11 of being an error, they wouldn't have replicated it now uh, 2,500 times since then. Uh, and, that's, and, and that's surely what they've done. But what they have done is demonstrated that we can have truly effective international adjudicative and dispute mechanisms. And surely we need them. But not for the purpose of protecting the wealthiest, most powerful institutions in the world, but for the purpose of protecting people who are disenfranchised, who are oppressed, who don't have basic human rights, who don't have access to drinking water or sanitation, or who are oppressed by states that, that imprison them or punish them or force them into forced labor. Um, so it's a good example of what can be established as a feature of international law if it was only used for the appropriate purpose. My sense of the arc of international law, say since 1985, which is in 1986, uh, U.S. tables its agenda for free trade with Canada and its agenda for the GATT, which dramatically expands those instruments beyond anything that has to do with trade and investment rules are a good example of that. You have kind of international human rights and trade law kind of more or less on a level playing field. Neither is terribly enforceable. Neither is articulated with any particular precision. And what's happened in the 20 years, 25 years since then, is that the rights of investors and corporations have delineate, been delineated with a great deal of precise uh, black letter law, and attached to which are these incredibly powerful enforcement mechanisms, where human rights law has remained kind of where it is, but the rights that are supposed to be protected by those instruments have suffered egregiously because of the rise of corporate rights. So in a way, this is, like, this is what's happened. Corporate rights have ascended, human rights have descended, and what we have to do, which way is the counter-revolution? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, no, no, sorry. It would go, it would go the other way. The counter-revolution, so that's what we are, counter-revolutionaries. So, um, join me in that struggle, or let me join you. Thank you very much.